Hello, everybody, and welcome back to That Got Dark, a true crime podcast. I am your host today, Kizaya, same as always, and as always, I have my co-host, Stefan. There we go. So, sorry about, um, we did take a, a couple of weeks off. We uh, both had some crazy things going on. It just, you know, we needed to take the time, but we are back and we're back with the weirdest case that I think we've covered as far as unsolved mist or yeah, as far as unsolved mysteries is concerned. This case is very, very weird. Before we get started on the case, I wanted to bring something up. Um, so sure. I watched devil's not, um yes i um i'm planning on watching it as well but steven did get to watch it and so i'm gonna let him talk about that for a minute because i didn't watch the whole movie it was (laughs) (laughs) it kind of really does kind of really doesn't work as a movie to be honest with you honestly if you've seen the documentary there's really no point in watching the movie (laughs) because It's just well, and go ahead. I was going to say, "Devil's Knot" is one of it's. It was made as a movie to sensation to sensationalize the case, and to kind of show that a lot of people were stepping away from the idea of the West Memphis Three having done it. That's what. That's the reason the movie was made. The movie wasn't made like it was made to sensationalize the case and bring attention to the case. I mean, sure, I guess, but I mean, really, the only difference between uh, watching Devil's Knot and Paradise Lost is Paradise Lost has the real people in it that were part of the case, and Devil's Knot is actors pretending to be those people. Like, it's weird because obviously <laughs> there's no there's no ending to it because. You know, the West Memphis Three was already still in the uh, in prison, and you know they still haven't caught uh, the person who did it, Terry Hobbs. And uh, you know, so, <laughs> so, so that has, was great, Terry Hobbs. It has no, it has no finish to it. There's no ending, really. It's just like, okay, this is as far as the case goes for now. So we're just gonna stop it now and put yeah. words on the case and. It's just, it's a weird movie. It's not great. It, it it just, it's not, a, it feels like a documentary while not being an actual documentary. <laughs> yes. So did you see that scene I told you about in the first movie? Uh, what- or in the first, in the first movie, in the first podcast series? Refresh. Where, memory. um, st- where Stevie's walking home with his mom and it makes you feel really sad because you know what happens to him later that day. Oh, well, I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, I knew what was going to happen to all those little boys. So all of it was sad, sad, sad. Um, oh, it, sad, really, sad, sad. it really does help me continue my opinion on fuck Terry Hobbs. Yes, fuck Terry Hobbs. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like fuck the police, but instead of being fuck the police, it's you know, fuck a murder, a child murder. I'm sure, I'm sure that's what that is. So yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you really, really want to watch it, watch it. But um, I recommend watching the Paradise Lost documentary if you choose. It's uh, I mean, it's yes. almost the same thing. <laughs> Well, not only that, but Paradise Lost has three parts, and you can, like, the Paradise Lost series covers all the way up to um, the Alfred plea. Well, I'm only... There is a, a part in Paradise Lost that covers the Alfred plea. Well, I'm only talking about the uh, the first one, because I've only seen the first part of the Paradise Lost documentaries, and it's it's almost beat for beat of uh, the movie. I mean, unless you're, like, a huge fan oh, of yeah. Renee Zellweger... Or you really want to see that dude that was in uh, <laughs> that that dude that was in, uh, the star of True Blood? I mean, it's not doesn't really have much to offer. It is it is a very strange. Uh, 
like I said, I will always choose the Paradise Lost films. I will always choose the Paradise Lost films because the Paradise Lost films cover more information and they cover a larger span of time. And it's the real people. We see Damien's. Yeah, like we, you know, when we watch Paradise Lost, we see Damien and the other boys' initial arrest and their, like, first couple of days in prison. And in the last Paradise Lost movie, we see them get released from prison. I will, so it really, like, I would always watch the Paradise Lost. I will movie. say that um, the actor who played Damien Eccles uh, was really good. I mean, it really felt like him based on what I've uh, seen of him on Paradise Lost. Like, I feel like he does a yes. pretty good job. Um, the other boys, <sighs> Jesse, Mc, uh, Miss Kelly, eh, maybe too sensationalized. I don't know. I don't, but the the kid that plays... The Gary thing with Eccles Jesse, story, Miss Kelly... Yeah, I have seen I have seen that kid, and I thought he did, I've seen scenes with that kid, in it and I think he did really good. The thing with Jesse Miss Kelly is when people make like when they were making this movie and they were putting a character in this movie of him, they kind of had to decide if he was going to be stupid as shit or complicit, and I think that's really difficult to do when you're trying hard not to when you're not a documentary and you're not really trying to um, push a narrative or you're not supposed to be trying to push a narrative. Uh, like I said, for me, it just, the movie was more, was less a movie and more just a, it was essentially like um, the reenactment scenes of, uh, of unsolved mysteries in the past, a reenactment, less, more reenactment, less movie. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. It was just kind of pointless having watched Paradise Lost to also watch Devil's Knot. Yeah, but I wanted to see it. Uh, I also am looking forward to watching the new Eliza Lamb documentary on Netflix, and I'm sure we'll talk about that when we watched it. Yes, I am so. very, very excited for that. We're also going to be covering, it's a Hulu series, not a Netflix series, but... If I'm not wrong, you have Hulu. And I do. We're, I do have Hulu. So we're going to be covering. I, I haven't decided when yet, but we're going to be watching through the entirety of the Melendez murders series on Hulu. And we're going to be doing an episode on that because I think people might be tired of hearing me cover children. So we're going to cover teenagers instead. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! So we're gonna do that. <laughs> people, with, people who's in the middle of puberty instead of beforehand. I mean, these kids were graduated from college um, or high school, not college. Oh, okay. So these were, you know, adults, um, and it's two boys that killed their parents. So we're, we'll talk about that eventually, because um, I think that would be a very oh. good case to cover. It's one of those cases, Fair it's enough. kind of like, it was very, very sensationalized at the time of its conception. It was one of the first, um, like, really public on TV court cases. So I think that would be a good one for us to cover. Uh, sure. I mean, you're the boss. Yes, I am the boss. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> 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 she's not used to actually hearing that so yeah no i'm not um but today we are going <laughs> <laughs> today we're covering the first uh the second season of unsolved mysteries and i am super duper excited about this you guys because this case is weird and you know how much i love weird cases and i'm actually going to conduct this episode a little or, or yeah this episode a little bit differently because i was unable to find any additional information that was not in the netflix documentary that was reliable so i won't have yeah, any additional information yes um and i don't know if you guys know this like there might be sometimes i pull up like posts or reddit posts or things like that but genuinely those are meant meant to show other sides of things but this doesn't really have 
side A, so there can't be a side B. So I'm not going to include any of that stuff. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each, each section and we're going to break it down. We're going to talk about what we think motives might be and different theories um, because I don't have any additional information to put out there that's reliable. Does that sound okay with you? Sounds great. Awesome. So let's get started. Um, the thing I want to talk about is this guy has two names. His name is John Wheeler. Friends refer to him the most as Jack in the Netflix documentary and the Unsolved Mysteries documentary. So we're going to call him Jack to minimize confusion. And um, just that way, when people are watching the documentary, I know I've heard that some people, um, there was one person in particular that I spoke to that they watched this right after they watched the Netflix show. They listened to this right after they watched the Netflix show. So if you're doing that, we're going to call him by the same name that they call him by. We're going to call him by Jack. Um, just so that we can kind of minimize any confusion. Um, the other thing I do yeah. want to put is that this case is extremely weird. So any theories that we put out there and any information that we put out there and any motives, ideas that we have is all speculation. It's all alleged. Because there's not even any suspects in this case. So we really can't, it, like I said, it's a very weird case. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more, but we'll jump into it. So this episode of Netflix is called The Washington Insider Murder. And that's because if you guys haven't watched the Netflix series. This was a guy who worked in Washington, D.C. and worked for the... Um, he worked for the, he worked for the government and the military, and I think that that is a, quite the interesting, um, job to have. So we'll talk about that here real quick. Um, so Jack had, um, kind of that job that you think of when you're like, Oh, like almost spy type deal, like not quite spy. Like he had very high security clearance. Um, he was working with um, a company that makes technology for Homeland Security, like drones and stuff like that. So he had a pretty interesting job. He's essentially the scientist every supervillain kidnaps in a comic book. <laughs> when they want to yeah. take over. So... He was, he's the guy that knows all the security codes to very, very important things, which I think is kind of crazy that this guy ended up dead. And his, like, we'll talk about this later, but his briefcase was missing. And his briefcase is apparently um, what held all of the secret stuff that he was in charge of. And that's just missing. Like, they never found it. Like, this case is weird. So what did you um, initially think of the case when you watched the episode? Well, first off, I actually kind of remember this when it happened. Really? Um, yeah, it happened. Oh, what was the year? 2010. It was in the 2000s, right? 2010. 2010 yeah. Just about 10 years ago. And I, I kind of re I remember hearing John Wheeler's name. And that's how I remember hearing him was John not Jack. So it was kind of, it was kind of jarring at first when they kept calling mm -hmm. him Jack. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I, I don't remember much about it. I just remembered that it was, you know, that it happened. And I remember hearing his name in the news. Wow. So when the episode opens, we are shown the landfill in Wilmington, Delaware, where his body was found. His body was found on New Year's Eve in 2010, so just before the turn of the year into 2011. Found with what I remember them saying was no obvious trauma. Um, <clears throat> and the thing that set out to them that this was a 
person, like an important person, was the fact that he was wearing a West Point class ring from the year 1966. Like, um, I don't know if you remember this, but the guy that found the body mentioned that, like, it was weird because he didn't have anything else on him. But, like, it was, like, the class ring and there was one other thing that was on him that identified him as somebody important. And the West Point class ring was one of those things. We're going to talk about some of West Point here in a little bit. Not a whole lot about West Point because there, I, I don't know a lot about West Point, and I honestly don't think it's very important to this case. What we're mainly going to be talking about is, um, if you remember correctly, when the house was trashed, his sword and shield from his West Point graduation were found on the floor. And I, I talked to somebody in our family that's in the, in the military and um, or was in the military for a long time. And he gave me some information. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so we're going to skip over the West Point thing for a little bit. But that's one of the things that identified him as somebody important was that he was wearing a West Point class ring. Hmm. So, he was a former White House aide, and he appeared um, when they actually got a look at him, and he had been taken in for an autopsy, and his clothes had been taken off. He appeared that somebody had been, like, beating the shit out of him. Like, the absolute shit out of him. He looked really busted up when they did the autopsy. In fact, that was what killed him with blunt force. Of the trauma variety, perhaps? Yes, of the trauma. Not head trauma, but blunt force trauma. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. So, did, they, did they say what blunt, like where was the force that killed him? You're saying it wasn't the head? It just, they didn't say anything. It was not blunt force trauma to the head. What it ended up being was they said that it just looked like somebody had beaten the fuck out of him. And the fact that there was blunt force trauma all over his body, like it was mainly in his, I think, his abdomen area, um, that was like a big deal to them. So that is like the point that they made, that it looked like he had been beaten the fuck out of. My assumption is, is that he probably, if he got beat the fuck out of, like they said he did, and there was a lot of blunt force trauma to his abdomen, is that he had some kind of internal bleeding. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, which is what would have killed him. He was clearly tortured to get information. It doesn't always have to be blunt force trauma to the head. It just, you know, blunt force trauma anywhere. Like, blunt force trauma to the head is blunt force trauma to the head because it causes brain bleeds and brain swells, um, which but, kills people. So, blunt force trauma to anywhere would cause similar things, like no, internal no, I bleeding. That. I was just curious. I don't remember if they said where exactly the, what part of the trauma killed him. But, um, yeah, I, he was obviously tortured for information. Yes, I, I definitely think so as well. The other thing that was interesting mm-hmm. about it is that this guy, his briefcase, like, so this guy, he apparently couldn't... He had such a horrible sense of direction, according to his family, that he couldn't remember where he parked his car half the time. But he always knew where his briefcase was, and that is, like, the only thing that they never found. I know I talked about this earlier, but that's the thing that's, like, the most interesting to me throughout the whole case. The one thing that they probably need to fucking find, they never found. And that was, like, the one thing that he had a really good handle on. Um, was that briefcase. I mean, according to his wife, he never went anywhere without it. And according to, like, the people that knew him, they never saw him leave it anywhere. So the other the other thing that we have to talk about is this guy was a veteran. I believe he was a uh, Vietnam vet, if I'm not wrong. Um, and he specifically talked at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in 1984, um, and his attorney describes him describes him as being a real patriot. So what that means to me is that this guy really, really loved his country. And anything that was done 
to cause issues or start trouble or like anything like that having to do with him must have like whatever this was it had to be directed at the country like they were trying to get information or something from the country or about the country or something like that because this guy really really loved his country so anything that went wrong in this case anything that was bad like that in this case had to have something to do with that because it seems like that was his main concern well i mean um yeah, country and the fact that he was working as a defense contractor. I mean, one, one, I mean that doesn't necessarily have to be about the country. It could be just about uh, information about the weapons he was, or the def- yeah, the weapons that he was uh, building, or so. Theory wise, it's 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 one of those two reasons. Yes. Um, so, like I said, he was described as a real patriot, and he was brought in to the White House as an aide by Michael Wine, who was the Secretary of Air Force during the first Bush administration, if I'm not wrong. I don't believe it was the second Did you say Bush administration. Michael DeWine? <laughs> no, Michael Wine. Wine and dine with Michael. This is not. (laughs) Shut up. Y'all are grounded up there. Y'all are pissing him off. I don't know why you're joking about that. Daddy DeWine is about to ground all of Ohio again. (laughs) If you guys don't know, both originally from Ohio, I don't live there anymore, but he does. And because of the coronavirus, our governor is one of the strictest governors in the United States <laughs> up there and uh, currently with cro- uh, coronavirus. And so Stephen is about to get grounded as a grown man because um, DeWine is pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, I, I, I put my hands Sorry, in the guys. cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go, guys. He is... Um, He's putting his hands in the cookie jar. He's stealing cookies. Bad deal. So Michael Wine, who was the who was the um, secretary of Air Force during the Bush administration, hired him um, as a White House aide, which I think was like some kind of assistant to him. It doesn't say specifically if he was the first Bush administration or the second Bush administration because there were two. I'm assuming the first because they don't talk about 9-11 or anything, but he might have been for the second. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I remember because I, th- I think the reason why I remember um, when he he was found dead was because he was a part of the Bush administration. So it was kind of a big deal at the time. You know, this guy actually worked under Bush's yeah. murder. Dumped. Oh, yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy landfill that's just that's just fucked up man yeah yeah I mean like of all the places to dump a body a landfill seems like the least sensitive I mean not that you're going to be sensitive when you're dumping a body but like really a landfill well my sister like, I just, seems uh... to think everybody is trash and someone decided to take that literally Jesus I believe your sister said that. <laughs> I met your sister. I believe she said that. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I will give this guy that he did great was he did lots of amazing things for veterans. Um, he um, also, in that definition, he inclu- uh, expanded the definition um, of wounded for veterans. So instead of it being like physically wounded, he was one of the guys that pushed that somebody could be mentally wounded as well. So he pushed for veterans to have extra help and expanded the definition of wounded so that they could get the help. Yeah, there's, not a, um, there's not a lot that I've noticed that seemed to be bad about this guy. This guy seems like he's generally a, a hardworking, good dude. I mean, yes. Um, I, I will say, I don't know this for sure, but given that he's one of the old timey veterans, I would guess that he had a lot of old timey views and I'm not saying that's not a bad thing. It's just, 
I noticed some people saying that they didn't go along with, I noticed some people saying that they didn't go along with his political views and stuff. And that doesn't make him a bad person. I'm just saying that it seems like maybe he didn't have political views that aligned with um, like modern issues at the time, well, if that now, makes any now sense. Now I kind of want you to elaborate um, on this. What kind of political views? I just, I, I think he was a Republican. I'm not, and I'm not saying that in like a derogatory way. I'm a centrist. I'm not a Democrat. So I really don't care either way. But I think a lot of like, there were some Democrats that were like, I don't know, like, like I said, it's none of it's reliable information. It was just some stuff that I happened to see that some people were like, oh, he's got old timey views and they didn't like that about him. But I don't think that that means he's a bad person or anything. I'm just I just saying to throw that out that's there. That's a broad so that spectrum. I don't, that could be, he has old timey views, meaning he's racist and wish you were still slaves. Or, or... No, no, I... Or he believes women should be in the kitchen. Um, or, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, no, I think it, I think that mainly what people were talking about when they talked when they talked about that, like, you gotta remember this guy grew up in, like, um, he graduated from West Point in 1966, so he's gonna have old-timey views. I think his old-timey views were mainly having to do with the LGBTQ, oh, so that was one. a big issue yeah, at the time. So that's... now, like, you got to remember that when this guy died, it was um, either right before or right after Obama got elected because it was 2010. So Obama either hadn't been elected yet or he was about to be elected in 2012 into his first no, Obama term. Was elected in 2008. So that was. First... Yep. Yeah, so he was halfway was through his first... first term. So and. Yeah. So Obama at the time was um, specifically he was pushing to give LGBTQ people more rights. Not that I think that this guy had anything against that. I'm just saying I heard, I, I saw some people saying that that's what he believed. Again, it's not reliable information. So he, I just you know, thought I'd put it out those, there. A man and a woman should be uh, the only ones that can marry. He might be. I don't know if he is or not. Again, I wanted to throw it out there. One of the things that I don't like to do, guys, and I know that sometimes it seems like we go on tangents and we're very disorganized, and we might be, but one of the things that I like to do is I like to try to mention all sides of things, which is why I'm bringing up that he might have been a Republican. He might have been against certain LGBTQ movements, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a good guy. Do I agree? Or that doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad guy. Um, I don't necessarily agree with those beliefs, but I also don't think that means he deserved to be killed. Um, and I don't know how reliable it is. I'm just trying to give you guys some of the information that I've seen so that you guys can kind of draw some conclusions on your own, especially in this case where there's no conclusions drawn at all. Not I, one. Not a singular I mean, conclusion. I, 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 would, I would not agree with his beliefs if, that was, if, he, does, if he was against the LGB. But unless he's beating the crap out of gay people, I guess, you know, we're not going to give him too much shit. <laughs> right. right. And I mean, the other thing you have to remember is some of these people that are saying this could literally just be saying that because he was an old timey dude, you know, because he graduated from West Point in 1966. He didn't necessarily have to be that way. There's no information about there out there about what he did or what he believed as far as that is concerned. So. I put it out there because it's potential information, but I don't know how reliable it is. And I've never, I haven't seen anything that puts those words coming out of his mouth. So keep in mind that, you know, this is as reliable as it could be. But like I said, it was very difficult to get reliable information in this case because there's no information, fucking no information. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Jack had bipolar disorder. Yeah. That's, that brings up a whole set of issues. It um, also kind of explains why he fought so hard for the um, the mental aspects of wounded warriors. Yes, 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 of course. Um, now, I do want to get one thing clear. I've been around people that have bipolar disorder before. I've been around people that have it, that were born with it, and people that developed it later in life. Um, one of the things you have to remember is that this is not a psychosis mental illness. 
So there's a theory out there that he freaked out and had a bipolar episode. And that's why he's dead because he did it to himself. That is not what bipolar disorder does to you. Not typically, not unless he was not taking his medication and hadn't been taking his medication for a long time. And he would have had to have some other kind of mental illness in connection with the bipolar disorder that would have caused something more serious. The bipolar disorder itself is not a psychosis type of disease. And I want to make that very, very clear. Um, because some people are like reliable, but that one of the theories is, is that he had a bipolar episode, kind of like Elisa Lamb, where they're like, oh, she had sort of this and it caused her to do this. And that's why she's dead. And a lot of people are saying that he had a bipolar disorder episode, a BPD episode. And that's what caused him to die, or he did something that caused him to die, which makes no fucking sense because it's not that kind of mental illness. So I want to get that out of the way right now. We'll talk about his behavior a little bit later. And he, and he pretty much dealt with it his entire life. Yes, so. he, and he was very clear. Um, his wife was very clear that he took his medications extremely regularly. And so was his stepdaughter that he took his medications extremely regularly. And bipolar disorder... Um, I'll kind of explain a little bit from what I understand. Bipolar disorder is mania and depression. So a mania uh, is extremely, is an extreme high. You're productive. You fixate. You focus. Um, for some people, a mania episode could be cleaning their entire house in an afternoon. Going on a shopping spree. or Right. Some people it's shopping. Some people it's like almost like an OCD type of mania. Mania is... While they're very destructive, in some cases, like one of the things you see on TV all the time in those commercials is that you might buy 17 of the same item and spend all your money and then you have to return everything. It does happen and it can be destructive in that way. But the thing that makes mania so destructive is the fall to a depression afterwards. Um, that's what makes BPD um, or bipolar disorder, so dangerous is well, the um, rise and fall. That's what makes it dangerous is the rise and fall. What what normally doesn't happen is you torture yourself because of bipolar. Exactly. Um, and, and again, it's not something like what um, Lisa Lamb had. And the medications that he was on, from what I understand, um, I, I couldn't get names, but I did do a little bit of research. And even though I couldn't get the names of the medications that he was on, from what I understand, the medications were not the types of medications that if you just went off of them would cause psychosis. Um, I've seen people go off their bipolar medication before. Does not cause psychosis. Again, and these people have severe bipolar disorder. And like I'm friends with these people. Like when I say that I've seen it happen, I've seen it happen. And it does not cause psychosis. Like, typically, these people are not running off and killing themselves over something like this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it tends to be the mania and the depression and the rise and fall that's exceptionally dangerous. Right. Um, so we'll talk about his behavior and maybe the connection to bipolar disorder in a little bit. But I did want to make it very clear that bipolar disorder doesn't tend to be a psychosis issue. Unless it's in combination with like postpartum psychosis or something like that that is specifically a psychosis disorder. Right. Um, so Catherine Kleiss was John's wife, and she was married to him for 13 years. Um, and she had a daughter named Meriwether, and that was Jack's stepdaughter. And Jack's stepdaughter seems very close to him, and she seemed very upset that her dad was, you know, her stepdad was gone and that there was no answer for him. Um, so I don't believe his had anything to do with this at all. Um, there are some theories that he was fighting at the time um, and that his wife had something to do with his death. And I don't believe that for a second. Even though they fought and they were fighting at the time, um, Allegedly, I could be wrong, but allegedly they were fighting at the time. That doesn't mean that 
she killed him or had him killed. This looked like a very well planned out hit. And I don't believe that for a second, this woman had planned out long enough how to kill her husband. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Plus, this is not a case. A, stealing the West Point, his, uh, breaking into his house and stealing the West Point stuff. It seems a little, a little weird for it to be in the life. Yes. Um, the other thing is that everybody was really, really shocked when Jack was murdered. Like, okay, so we talked about the fact that we're going to cover the Melendez brothers case here in a couple of weeks. When the father of the Melendez boys was murdered, all of his friends said that they were not shocked, that they figured that at some point somebody was going to kill him because he was a bad dude. But that was not the case with Jack. Everybody was super duper shocked he was dead. All of his friends, all of his family, all of his acquaintances were just shocked that he was dead because they were like, Jack doesn't do anything bad to anybody. Why would he be dead? So once it occurred to the family and everybody else that they could not think of anybody that would do this because they couldn't imagine why Jack was dead anyway, then they started asking questions, obviously, and some things started coming out. Do you remember what they said his autopsy said? Uh, It was some kind of blunt force trauma. Yes, it was um, essentially, in layman's terms, it looks like his body had been absolutely beat the fuck out of before he died. Like Like I said, tortured. Yes, he was um, assaulted. Very uh, well and good before his death. Um, The other thing to mention is that he worked for something called the Mitre Corporation at the time. um, At the time of his death. And it creates security tech for the government and the military. Um, So that would be a reason maybe that he would be dead. I, I don't know. This case is... It's just like... This case is weird to me, but it's weird to me in a different way than the other weird cases we cover. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, kind of. I mean, uh, not a lot of our cases that we deal with has to deal with, like, government espionage and torture for information. It's normally just sadistic violence for fun. Right. And I mean, like, so I do want to say this, because I do not... (laughs) All of this is alleged. I'm not saying any of this is fact or anything like that. Like, again, this case is one of those cases where I'm not really worried about that because there's no information. I'm not giving you guys anything. But I do want to say that because, you know, true crime is a, is a dangerous gig. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we know that he was working for this MITRE corporation at the time of his death. And that is where we fall in with the briefcase. You remember the briefcase? I'm talking about the briefcase. Yeah, he, he lost it. Well, yes. In that briefcase was tons of information from his job at Miter Yeah, I say lost, so, it wasn't like literally stolen. <laughs> I think it was stolen. I don't think he lost it. If he lost it, they would have found it in his car like no, no, later. No, I know, I'm saying... I mean, I, I, I misspoke when I said he lost it <laughs> because, come on, he was beaten, he was tortured for information. Yeah. They stole that briefcase. <laughs> Whoever killed him. Oh, yeah, they did. So on December 31st, on New Year's Eve of 2010, is when Jack's body is found at the landfill. And according to the uh, detective that works the case, there was nothing found with the body that was considered evidence except for his like obviously like what he was wearing and like the West Point ring and things like that right because they're identifying factors but those were the only things that they found with the body that had anything to do with the case so when the body was found it was initially checked by um, the people like the police for the area that the landfill was in. And then once they realized that he lived in, I think it's Castle or Castile, um, that police de- department was notified extremely quickly after that. Um, 
there were they were apparently on their way's house to Jack's or on their way to Jack's house anyway because they were investigating a burglary. Now here is where things get a little strange because remember when I said I talked to um, my sister-in-law's husband about West Point because I didn't know a whole lot about it. We're going to talk about that and the information I got here in just one second. So let's talk about how the house was found first. So Jack's neighbor, his name is Robert Dill. He noticed that there was a window at the back of the house on the second floor that was open. And he said that that was weird. Um, Obviously, on the East Coast, you typically aren't going to be leaving your windows open. I mean, I don't know. I don't know anything about the West Coast. I've never lived there. But, you know, I've lived on the east side of the country my whole life, minus three years that I spent in Arizona. And you don't leave your windows open. You just don't. Even if you're in a nice area, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, Especially, like, I so this guy. You are working as a defense contractor in high security areas. Maybe you aren't the best at, you know, maybe you are a uh, little better at, you know, security and concern about those kind of things. Right, right. So. This guy noticed, he's like, that's weird. And he went into the house, and he found the door open. He found, so, in Ohio, I don't know about lots of other places. I lived in Ohio for most of my life. In Ohio, we have two sets of doors. One is called a storm door, which is, like, it's not really a storm door. It's, like, a door that is behind the actual door towards the inside of the house, And it's got glass and a screen on it, typically, so that you can leave your door open, like, in the winter if you want to. Um, Or in the summer or, like, whatever, without weather getting inside the house and without leaving your house exposed, right? right? That door was open. Yeah. Um, I believe it was that door that was open. No. That door was on the floor. And the other door was cracked open, if I'm not wrong. I could be wrong about that. I don't remember it specifically. I didn't write down the exact description of the house. But the first thing that he noticed when he went into the house was that the kitchen was completely destroyed. It was absolutely trashed. Like, it looked like somebody had gone through and just, like, purposely done weird shit, right? There were spices spilled all over the floor. There was scarring powder on the floor. And the important thing in this area is that Jack's West Point and sword or West Point sword and shield, um, which were ceremonial were found on the floor. Now the guy that I talked to was a Marine and I called him and I asked him, I was like, Hey, I don't know the significance of any of this shit. Could you please tell me what this would mean? And he was like, it is the equivalent of somebody coming into my house and throwing all of my Marine Corps shit on the floor. Like, it is a massive disrespect, and whoever did that, if it wasn't him that did that, knew that it would be a massive disrespect. So, for Kazea, if someone was coming into her house and they stole her her Harry Potter wands, this is the equivalent. Or my pasta. That would also be a massive disrespect. How did you know you steal my ragu? Oh, my God. This is apparently a major disrespect. And I didn't know that. And on top of I didn't know that, something they talk about in the... um, in the They don't talk about it at all. And I figured that would be something important, right? Because if it wasn't him that trashed his own kitchen, then wouldn't it be important to make a point that it would have been somebody that disrespect... that didn't like him or didn't respect the him as a person that would go into his house and purposely throw something on the floor that he would find at home later on and know it was a massive disrespect. Like that could have been his warning, you know, like how the Italian mobs horses heads in your bed or whatever. They may have wanted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to get him to give them the information before they tortured him. 
Right. I just thought that was an interesting little piece. Um, there was also a very clear footprint on the floor from a bare foot in the scarring powder. The foot probably was wet, and that's just something that I'm coming to the conclusion of. It's not something that they said, but because of, like, when you look at the foot, like the foot powder, it looks like it was maybe sweaty or damp or wet, or maybe had the first had been out in the rain, like this footprint, because it was like a fucking perfect footprint, right? That's why I think the foot might have been wet. At this point, the neighbor calls the police, and that's why when the police are alerted to Jack's body being discovered, they're already on his way over to the house. Um, one of the things that they do mention in the case is that there is a house across the street from Jack's house that's under construction that Jack apparently was not happy about. And they talk about the fact that there were smoke bombs set off at that house a couple of days prior. And when the smoke bombs were set off, when the police got there to check everything out, you see crazy amounts of smoke billowing from a construction site. You're going to go check it out. (sighs) They found that um, Jack's phone was actually on the property. That one was weird. Yeah, like, I I don't know. Maybe there was, like, maybe him and the guy that built the house were, like, fighting and going back and forth, and maybe that's who broke into the house and threw all his stuff on the floor. It explains the disrespect angle. I mean, if you're coming to my brand-new construction house site thing and setting off smoke bombs, I'm not exactly going to go into your house and be disrespectful. Or I'm not exactly going to go into your house and be respectful. Like, when you think about it, it could have been a warning, but it could have also been completely unrelated. Well, another thing you got to think of is because the person that stole his uh, sword and shield um, probably was someone who knows what the significance of that is. Yes. The sword and shield wasn't stolen. Um, I just want to clarify that for you. They were thrown on the floor oh, in the kitchen. My bad. I was thinking they stole it. No, no, no. That's why it's a major disrespect because it was left there on the floor for him to find. That that even more reinforces my point. The person that tossed it on the ground probably knew how disrespectful that would be. Because if, like, say, like me or you go in and break into a house, do you think we would know or give a crap about a sword and shield? I mean, not really. Like, I mean, I know I damn for sure wouldn't. Like, you could, however, I will put this out there. There are things in most houses that you can see that have some significance and some importance that you knew or that you know would be, like, a disrespect or would upset the person when they came home if they found Mm -hmm. it destroyed. Everybody has those things in their house. You know what I mean? It was in the kitchen. Like, we're right when you walk in the door, right by the uh, sink. Was it put away somewhere, or was it prominently displayed? They don't say, but I assume it was prominently displayed because it's supposed to, like, that's what it's for. It's like a ceremonial thing when you graduate West Point. It also means, according to um, our Marine informant, that he graduated with honors. So I can't imagine that he would graduate with honors, get this super special thing that not everybody gets. Not everybody gets the sword and shield. So not everybody gets it. So he probably had it on display. I don't know for sure, but like if I graduated with honors and I had this thing that was like super special proof of it that not everybody else had, I'd display it. Right, right, right. I'm I'm just saying if it was displayed, yeah, I guess I can see where somebody might not realize what it is and just toss it. But if it's not, if it was put away and not displayed prominently, then somebody definitely knew. And it was, it's likely the person that did that was a military man who knows about West Point. I don't know. Like I said, I think that it could have been something that. Or, you know, it didn't have to be a military person. Like I said. His death could have been completely unrelated to the break-in. 
he did set those smoke bombs off at somebody at somebody's house construction site because he was annoyed that he considered historical well, grounds. So how do we know that? I mean, yes, there are a lot of weird coincidences, but how do we know that the guy that was building the house across the street wasn't like, you know what, I'm going to show this dude and knew that he was a military dude, knew that he went to West Point because he wore his ring all the time and was like, hey, what's the biggest disrespect to somebody that graduated from West Point to like one of his buddies that was in the military or something? And they were like, well, if he has the super special ceremonial sword and shield, if you throw that on the floor, that'll show him. You know, and then so he went into this kitchen, found the sword and shield, dumped it on the floor and trashed the floor and everything else. It it would be super coincidental if he was having this problem with this guy and the break in of his house and the torture and murder of him are two completely unrelated things. So close together. That is super coincidental. I mean, yeah, but weirder things have happened. You know what I'm saying? Casey Anthony got off her, you know, manslaughter, whatever, first degree murder charge. I think that's the strangest thing I've ever seen. So, you know, no no telling what this is. <laughs> yeah, but for me, that they have to be related is what I'm trying to get at. I believe they are related. I don't know. I don't know if I believe they are or not. I'm just trying to put the information there. Like I said, I'm with this case, I don't have a lot of information. Um, one of the things that I will say is that I think that there's a lot of different ways to look at this case. There's a lot of different angles. And I think that that is one of the main reasons that they haven't solved this case. Yeah. If they were focusing on solving it from one angle, they would solve it. Right. But there's like seven angles to go at it from. So if you're going at it from all seven separate angles, then it's going to be really, 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 really difficult to pinpoint what pieces go with what. You know what I'm saying? Right. It'd be like if you were doing a paint by number. And you were jumping around to different places in the board every time you colored one space with one color. It'd be really hard to see the whole picture because you're not finishing one section. Sure, sure. So this was so serious. They had government agencies getting involved. Like, the FBI was involved in this case for a while. I don't know if they still are, but I know they were for a while. Um, And it probably honestly was a good thing because the FBI has a lot of clearances that normal police departments and normal people like you and I do not. So it probably helped a lot to get some of the information out, you know? Yeah, definitely. One of the things that they do say... Yeah, definitely more clearance, and, like, that might be why we have all this different footage of him the night that he went missing, or, you know, why we know that his sword and shield was thrown on the floor. They might not have, like, the police might not have released that because they might not have known that it was a significant thing. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I think having the FBI involved definitely helped. Um, The last time that Jack was seen by his family, in person, alive, was on December 28th. Um, Apparently his wife was kind of mad at him because it was right after Christmas and he left for D.C. to work. Um, He went from Delaware to D.C. and he was on the phone a lot in that time period. That is another one of the things that is like very beautiful about the FBI being involved in this case is they did a lot of digging into his phone records. So we know that Jack was on his phone practically the whole time from Delaware to D.C. Right. The whole time. Not only that, but he works in D.C. on the 28th for no more than a couple of hours, according to the FBI investigator. No more than a couple of hours. And then after that couple of hours is up, his phone is 
used again in Newcastle. So we know he didn't stay there for that long. And not only that, but that night, the 28th, is the night of the smoke bomb incident, which is why he doesn't go to work the next day. In fact, on the 29th, Jack calls his boss and tells his employer that somebody broke into his house and stole things that he needed for his job, um, like his briefcase and his phone. I think he probably knew where his phone was, but he knew better than to go asking about it, you know? But... This is the first time we hear of his briefcase being missing. The thing is, though, is that Jack doesn't notify his wife or his the police about the break-in at his house. And I don't know if that's because maybe he did it. Like, some people suggest that he did it. Like, that's one of the theories. Or because he knew that he did something illegal by going on to somebody else's property and setting off smoke bombs, and he knew, he thought this was, like, some kind of retaliation for that, so he didn't want to say anything, because he didn't want to get in trouble for what he did the day before, you know? I don't know which, but both of those would make logical sense to me, you know? Another logical reason would be that he was fighting with his wife at the time because he had left a couple of days after Christmas to work in D.C. That would be another reason why maybe he didn't tell her. But that wouldn't explain why he didn't tell the cops. So that one I'm not so sure about. So on the 29th, Jack visits a local pharmacy. He's looking for a ride into Wilmington to pick up his car. Apparently, when he went to D.C., he left his car at the bus station and didn't pick it up before he went back to town. So he was looking for somebody to um, give him a ride to what he thought was the proper parking garage for that his car was at. Um, and he's seen on camera doing all that. The next time he's seen is 45 minutes later at the wrong car garage for his car. Now, this is not abnormal for Jack because the family, mainly his stepdaughter and his wife at the time, both said that he would literally park his car somewhere and just forget where he parked it. Which is a little weird for me. I mean, yes, but I, I'm super forgetful. Like, you know me. I'll, like, straight up forget that I've left a pot on the stove. Like, I'm hella forgetful. And I have never forgotten where I parked my car because your car is like, you know, you spend a lot of money on your car. You spend a lot of money on to keep your car nice and to do the maintenance on it. You know, unless he was drunk on a regular basis, I can't see why he wouldn't be able to find his car. They said he had a question, but I don't know if that explains it. You know, I haven't been drunk some of the times. When I'm in a big parking lot, or if I like, so I like I go to Cedar Point all day, I will. I can. I, I. It's there's been times I've forgotten where I was. I've gotten the. I've gotten. The I mean, yes, I take a but when I'm in a huge parking lot and I know I'm going to be gone for a long time, I'll take a picture now um, of where my parking spot is to uh, to not forget. that's smart um but the thing is is that when he was losing his car it was it was at his place of employment now i don't know about you but when i go to work i tend to park in the same place or as close to the same place every single day oh i'm a creature of habit too i do the same thing because And I actually, like, there was one or two times I got really pissed off that my spot was taken. I was like, like, I had a really bad morning or whatever. And I was like, damn it, I just wanted to park my car in my spot. And my spot wasn't there because somebody else parked it. So I'm shocked that he didn't develop those habits because that would fall right in line with his mania. Like, when you have bipolar disorder, you're... Most people with bipolar disorder are extremely habitual creatures. At least the ones that I know are extremely habitual. Like, they only use 
certain parking spaces or they like to park in the same spot or the same area or like they tend to drink the same thing over and over and over again stuff like that like not quite OCD but definitely noticeable you know um so I don't know I'm a little shocked that he didn't he wasn't more habitual in that case but apparently, according to him, it was not, according to the family, it was not abnormal for him to park his car and just forget where he parked it and take a cab home. Like I said, it's a little strange to me, but according to them, that's not abnormal. So he's found, he's seen on camera after 45 minutes. So he goes to the farm, 45 minute lull where he's not seen on camera anywhere. And then he is seen on camera again at the wrong parking garage 45 minutes later. Um, the family said that he had a horrible sense of direction. And he was acting very strange on the tape. He was distressed. He was kind of paranoid, acting like he was trying to get away from someone or something. Um and the FBI agent that investigated the case said that this was one of the biggest mysteries of the case because he can't explain to the family what happened in that 45-minute timeline that was making Jack act so erratic when he was seen on the camera, like on the camera at the parking garage, which I agree is strange because that is not typically how bipolar disorder manifests itself. You aren't typically acting paranoid and distressed and, you know, this isn't a case of some kind of psychosis disorder, you know. I do find that a little bit strange as well. So the next time Jack's seen on camera isn't until several hours later um, in the Nimmers building. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's a building downtown. Um, he's in the basement, and that's where he's seen next. Now, one of the other things I do want to mention about the parking garage is that he told the attendant at the parking garage that he couldn't find his car, that his car was lost. And she was like, well, where's your, um, like your parking ticket? I can help you find it if you give me your parking ticket. And he was like, no, that was in my briefcase, and my briefcase was stolen. According to him, yes. According to him, his briefcase so, was still on the night of the break-in. I don't know if that's true, though. He could... So, which makes me... So maybe, do, does he have a set parking ticket that is... You have an idea? Huh? I'm sorry? Do you have an idea? Uh, no, I, I was saying that does he have a parking ticket that is designated to him and not one that he grabs every time he goes to work or goes to that parking lot? I don't think so. They, the family didn't say anything about him having like a designated parking spot that was his. No, I know, but if he lost his ticket in his briefcase and his briefcase was already stolen, that kind of doesn't line up unless he already had the parking ticket before he uh, left. Wally had the well, remember, remember this, his car got lost at this point. It was like three days, three days beforehand. His oh, so car, was... he parked, okay. he parked his car on the 28th, claims his briefcase got stolen on the 28th, although we don't know if that is true. And then this is all happening on the 29th. So this is all happening at the very earliest one day later. Okay, okay. Okay, so he would have already had the parking ticket, probably. Yes, Before he would have had the parking ticket because he parked the car when he went to D.C. to do work. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, now, the cops claim that he spent the night of the 30th, well, from the 29th to the 30th, and most of the day on the 30th in the basement of that building that he was seen in hours after the 
um, parking garage film. Right. He is seen exiting the building at 8.30 at night wearing a black hoodie. And according to cops and the family, this is super odd. He is very much put together and kind of like uppity almost. Like he's always in a suit. He's always dressed really nice. He's always got his really nice watch on, you know. And, you know, so for them to see him leaving in a black hoodie was weird, according to them. Right. Now, the very, very last time he's seen on camera before his body is found is, I believe, just a few moments later. He was walking out on the street and he is seen on the camera in front of a hotel. So that is the very last time his body would have been seen on camera or he would have been seen on camera before his body was found. Right. Now, Jack apparently went to Newark that night. One of the witnesses, they like, so they see all the police see all this footage and the FBI see all this footage start putting out pictures of Jack and they're like, Hey, if you saw this guy between this time and this time on this day and this day, please what you saw. And one of the, um, one of the uh, witnesses said that they saw him getting, sharing a cab to Newark, which apparently was like three hours away or something like it was a decent distance away. Um, and then the only evidence that we have, after that is that there was partial DNA, a partial DNA match for Jack found in a dumpster in Newark, um, which is a little strange. Um, another thing that they mentioned, which I've already talked about, and this is all being mentioned at the end of the episode. That's why it's all kind of jarbled, um, is that Jack was extremely upset about the, um, house being built but we've talked about that already um so let's talk about something that was said by a couple of um like dumpster picker uppers you know like the guys that drive garbage trucks and pick up dumpsters and stuff i don't think that's the technical yeah um i like i was gonna say i don't think garbage picker uppers yeah or woman i'm not sexist (laughs) (laughs) so we, the garbage men, say that sometimes homeless people hide in the dumpsters to get away from the cold. Yeah, I don't see that. Um, and that, no, I don't see that happening. They think that that maybe is what Jack did. Like, maybe, like, people treat bipolar disorder like it's fucking schizophrenia. Yeah. And it's not. They literally treat it like if you're in the middle of a psychotic episode with this illness... That you're going to start acting crazy and doing insane things and climbing in dumpsters, climbing in dumpsters for no good reason. Man, like, and that's not that's no, not how this uh, disease manifests itself. Yeah, that's not how this mental illness manifests itself. It's not, you know, not by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, I know plenty of people that are bipolar, don't have medication. And live relatively normal lives. Unless they're drunk. Typically, bipolar disorder manifests itself differently when he's drunk. But they didn't say anything about there being alcohol found in his system when the body was found. Or about him having been acting intoxicated. I would say that it's way more likely that his body was dumped in that dumpster. And the the garbage man took the body and dumped it in the landfill and didn't realize it was in there. I mean, yeah, I would say so, too, because really, if that were the case, if if Jack really was just hiding in there to get away from the cold, don't you think the thing that he was sleeping in moving would have like shocked him and he would have woken up and been like, whoa, hang on, let me get out real quick. Or like he wouldn't have just stayed in there. (laughs) I mean, more likely dumped, but I guess it's possible he could have been hiding from some people and attacking them. Either way, I'm not really sure. This case is weird. Yes. This case is weird because you would have expected by now for his body or for his briefcase to have been found, right? It's been about 10 years at this point. 
that's and okay. <laughs> it's just strange to me. Like, well, yeah, somebody took it, but like, if it wasn't something more serious than, like, if it was just the fact that maybe Jack was sleeping, was having this weird psychosis disorder that doesn't typically manifest with bipolar disorder, and was sleeping in a dumpster, wouldn't the family have found his briefcase in his car later? Or anywhere later? Yeah, no, I don't. Nothing about this case screams that that happened. (laughs) No, not by a long shot. Now, the more curious question is, what exactly did the people want? Why was he tortured? Because to me, that's the obvious part of this case. This man was tortured for information he knew. And the curious part about it is, why? For me, it's not that he was murdered. It was, why was he murdered? Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. Just the difficult part with this case is, is I almost kind of don't want to make any speculations on it, you know, just in case. That and I don't know how I would make a speculation with this case. It's almost impossible to make any speculations with this case because it's so... There's too many variables. <laughs> exactly. Like, it why, is. Why the break-in? Um how did he lose his phone over where he threw smoke bombs? I mean, I I think the most concrete thing is that he was tortured based on his autopsy. Um, Even the fact that he was found in a landfill or dumpster makes sense. Like what a better way to, I mean, that's a pretty good way to dispose of a body, you know? Um, Mm Mm-hmm. And if you're clean and you don't leave evidence, it's a hell of a way to dispose of a body. Oh, yeah. It's just one of those things, like, the more I sit and think on it, the more I'm like, I don't even know how I begin to, like, try to draw any conclusions or come up with any theories for this case. Because, so, I took my, my, the only year that I spent in college was spent in a bioscience program where I had to do a bunch of labs. Like I think one semester I was taking two or three labs, like all at the same time. And one of the things that they talk about is that you can only manipulate one variable at a time when you're doing like some kind of experiment or some kind of something like that, because you need to be able to control the variables so you can prove what you're manipulating is affecting the like the um <clears throat> that what you're not affecting and this case like it's not like that like it's not like the Chris Watts case where we can prove that the fact that he had a mistress affected his everyday life right we can prove that this independent variable was affected by the dependent variable yeah that's that's science that's just that's science i mean that's like, we can't, we can't do that with this case. We can't, like, and, and a lot of times when I'm sitting down and I'm breaking down cases just because I'm an, that's the type of person I am, I try to break things down like that. And I'm like, why did this happen? And typically the reason that it happened is, like, your independent variable and what it affected is your dependent variable. And I can't do that with this case because there's so many different things. And I'm like, like, I remember when I was doing research for this case, I was running around in circles like literally chasing my tail, trying to find additional information. There was just nothing out there because everything is so strange that you can't tell what's reliable and what's not, you know, like it's weird. So I know this is a hard one, but I have a feeling that the one part of this whole weird story that I'm guessing is not a, is not as connected as the rest of it is the smoke bomb at the, uh, the, um, that building across the street. I would agree. I don't really know where that comes in at all. I don't think that has anything to do with it because I don't think that that is enough for someone. I mean, I guess <coughs> drive someone over the edge to murder someone, but I don't see him being a suspect, the guy who was building that building. 
No, I don't either. Like, like I said, I think that, I think that that was just something that kind of is there. Yeah. But I think that the break-in of this house is definitely connected to all this. I think that the person who did all this, or the group of people, because let's face it, it's more than likely not just one person, um, broke into his house trying to find something. They found his briefcase. They took his briefcase. Um, apparently it's someone who really was not happy with him because they, they disrespected his um, West Point stuff. They didn't find exactly what they were looking for in that briefcase. That's when they decided to right. kidnap him, torture him for the information, and then kill him. That is like the best theory I can think of. Obviously, there's no way to know what exactly they wanted to know. I mean, there's not enough evidence for that other than it probably had something to do with his defense job. It could have been terrorist. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it could have been anything. I... Job. Who knows? This case, it, it's just one of those cases that was so weird for me that I really honestly, genuinely, like, I was stumped at the end. Like, most of the cases from the first season, like, they, they, to be completely fair, they did kick it off with a pretty strong unsolved mystery case. Like, because you and I, last year when we were doing the first season, we pretty much felt like we had everything solved. Like, I don't know if you remember that, but we were pretty confident that we had everything. (laughs) I mean, yes, but we both, we both pretty much had, like, for each case, we both had some kind of like, I think this happened. Well, you had right, and I don't. Of those. You had actual suspects. Where this one, there is no suspects. I mean, there could be. I mean, I guess there. You could argue that maybe it's the wife or this, but logically, really, there isn't any likely sub- suspects. Right. Where thirteen minutes, we literally argued the entire episode about it not being the husband <laughs> or being the I mean I believed it was the husband and you are apparently delusional <laughs> I believed it's likely too but I wanted to give some defense to him <laughs> I mean I was not interested with giving the guy defense I noticed like I I don't like to be that person like I know it makes me sound really horrible I don't like to be that person but when when you're guilty and you look fucking guilty you look fucking guilty and I think that you you look guilty guilty I couldn't couldn't even play devil's advocate with our last episode fuck Chris Watts fuck Chris Watts that's right (laughs) <laughs> well okay so you want to you guys want to know something kind of crazy and i am absolutely mind boggled that these people had the audacity to do something like this chris watts's parents want shanann bella and cc's insurance money for their life insurance policy of course they do i'm like are you fucking kidding me No, you don't get to have that. First of all, Shanann's life insurance does go to her family because they lost their daughter. I don't care that you lost your daughter-in-law. They lost their daughter. Right. And then you guys can duke it out over Bella and Cece's life insurance if you really want to. I don't see why they would want Bella and Cece's life insurance. I mean, yes, they lost their granddaughters, but I don't see why they would want it. Your son took your granddaughter's lives. Why do you feel like you're entitled to their life insurance now? Well, that's two different questions. <laughs> One is, uh, is you saying that they don't deserve it. The other is why would you, is a question of why would they want it? They would. One way you could look at it is that they lost their granddaughters. At least this is a positive in this horrible situation. I don't believe that they deserve it. And I'll tell you why I don't believe that they deserve it. I also don't believe that they deserve it. I'm just saying that. 
from their perspective, especially if they're really, really trying not to believe that their son did this. That also greedy. <laughs> They know that their son did this. They stood up in the courtroom when Chris was con- convicted and sentenced. They stood up in the courtroom and whined and cried about how much they missed Shanann and their granddaughters, but how they forgave Chris anyway. Oh, wow. Like that literally, like you can go out there and find the video. There is videographic film evidence that they stood up and said that they missed all they they loved their granddaughters and maybe Chris can one day explain to them why this had to happen but they forgive him. Like you don't get fucking anything. I'm sorry but you don't. <laughs> right. I just can't. Also guys, I would like to tell you all that there is now a Facebook group for this podcast if you guys are interested in joining. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> I'm actually really excited because we like have some people on the page, but I'm excited to get the information out there to you guys because um, I really, you know, I'm I'm excited to start interacting with you guys. Uh, if you guys are interested in joining the Facebook group is called That Got Dark, a true crime podcast. Um, and it's got all kinds of, you know, we've got some people posting some interesting cases that we're thinking about covering. It's a good place for Steven and I to interact with you guys. If you guys want to join, it's a really good place for us to and we take will have case a suggestions. We will. <laughs> yes. So please join you guys. I would, I would love to interact with some of you guys. And I also now have a Twitter for our podcast. Um, trying to remember what it is. I believe I think that got dark pod, but I'm just gonna I think um double check. What about you, Steven? What do you want to plug today? Oh, well you can find me on Dragon Blazer Productions, on the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the YouTubes. You can also find me on Dragon Blazer Pro on the Twitter. Uh, I apologize for the YouTube because of where I'm living right now. I haven't been able to start uh, to upload a lot of things on YouTube. Um, it just takes forever using my hotspot. Unfortunately, if there's any kind of bugginess from uh, our podcast here today, um, that's because of where I live currently. I do not have Wi-Fi. I'm using my uh, my phone, and uh, unfortunately... I don't have a better situation as of right now. Hopefully it gets better in the future. Um, So right now I haven't really updated my YouTube, but it's still there. I still have a lot of content, like 70 to 80 uh, items on my YouTube channel. But um, I I, I update the rest of them. I always put new, new, new shows on all my stuff, my Instagram, my Facebook, and my Twitter. I, uh, I, I promote all these shows. I promote my other podcasts that I have as well. Because um, I do way too many. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yes. If you guys are interested in wrestling and stuff, you guys should check out Steven's other podcast. He's got some great ones. Um, and just so you guys know, that Twitter is That Got Dark Pod. So that got dark and then pod like the like a pea pod or something I don't, I don't know yes so unless you have anything else you would like to add steven yeah i think we are ready to close There's out no one to say fuck to <laughs> yeah that's the thing like i'm so used to us being like Fuck this guy. Yeah. Fuck that police officer. Fuck this. Like there's and, nothing. And, and like I don't even know if I can say fuck the police because I don't. I don't think the police did a like a horribly bad job in this. It's just a tough case to call, solve. Yeah, really. It's. I mean, it's like it's not even. It just kind of sucks because, like, typically one would think like, oh, hey, you know, 
fuck the fuck the FBI because they got involved in the case and they didn't do enough. But no, this is actually one of those few times that the FBI got involved in a local police department's investigation and didn't get kicked out of it. Like I, I don't even know like no. like they everything was done right. <laughs> It's just a tough case. <laughs> but, you know, I, I will say, although I think I like the first uh, volumes, episode one, better, the first episodes of these uh, two volumes of uh, Unsolved Mystery have been pretty strong. Oh, yeah. Very, very strong. Um, I hope they keep that going for the rest of the season because I'm really looking forward to some of the other po- uh, some of the other episodes that they have out for podcasts. Yeah, we got ghosts. Um, I think there's a... Yes, I'm, I'm excited for Steven to take over and do a ghost episode. Um, also, if you guys do join the um, Facebook group, let us know if there's any supernatural stuff that you would like us to cover, because Steven would totally like to take over again, maybe even more frequently. I think he said he wanted to do something on vampires. Yeah, um, my first... Uh... Natural episode outside of unsolved comedies or unsolved mysteries. Sorry, <laughs> bad habit. Uh, I want to cover um, vampire lore, and uh, I will be co- plan on trying to cover. And it may have to be a two-part episode, depends on how much information I find. But I want to cover um, a little bit about Elizabeth Bathory and um, the Countess Elizabeth Bathory and. Uh, if you guys, <laughs> which was the yes, of Count Dracula. Um, if you guys also don't know who Elizabeth Bathory is, she is who Bloody Mary is like the story of Bloody Mary is based on because, um, you know, bathing in the blood of virgins is something that was really? done in early England. I guess I, you know, I, 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 I have never, I've never heard that. I didn't. She yeah, that's like Bloody when Mary. they talk about Bloody Mary, um, like that's like the back, like the way back, back origin story. At least that's what I've heard is that because she was bathing in the blood of virgins, virgins, and that's like how Bloody Mary. I don't know. I'll have to look into it when I do the episode, but um, I was going to bring her up because um, we take a lot of her. Now, she's a real-life person in history, as well as Vlad the Inveiler. Um, they, obviously pro- they, were, they obviously weren't actual vampires, but we take a lot... There, there's a lot of inspiration taken from these two cases. Um, Vlad the Impaler has a lot of, a lot of information based on the fact that, uh, on Dracula. Bram Stoker took a lot of uh, inspiration from uh, Vlad the Impaler. And then Elizabeth Bathory, we take a lot of, like, the the power of blood, essentially, is kind of where we take um, from Elizabeth Bathory. We, we've kind of taken the whole bathing in blood, blood being powerful, and kind of gave that to vampires. So um, a lot of inspiration from these two um, historical figures. Uh, Elizabeth Bathory oh, yeah. is also in the Guinness World Book of World Records, just a little teaser, as the um, most prolific serial female serial killer of all time. Yes, um, because she killed virgins just oh. to drain their blood, which, first of all, back in the day was a lengthy fucking process, <laughs> and bathed it. Yeah. You sure know how to pick them. I'm the bad guy because I like to talk about child murder, but you want to talk about 14-year-olds being slaughtered for their blood. Um, they're virgins. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, I believe all the children I've talked about were virgins, too. Like, damn. Yeah, but this is, like, le- legit virgin sacrifices. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I will leave that to you, then, to do your research for <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll look into that. that. That should be sometime after we finish these unsolved count, uh, mystery cases. Yes. Also, guys, I've been thinking about maybe covering um, the um, Elisa Lamb Netflix documentary on this podcast as like an add-on to our original Elisa Lamb um episode so if you guys would like something like that let me know and 
Steven and I will see if we can make it happen because we're going to watch the Netflix documentary anyway. So if you guys want an episode on it, let us know. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of that's also going to depend on how much new information we get from this documentary compared to the information we already gave. We don't really want to rehash an episode we've already done. I don't know, man. That case still creeps me out. I don't even like, I don't even want to. Nope, I'm good. I'm not saying it's not creepy. I'm just saying that if they don't give us new information we didn't already tell people, our listeners, then there's no point in adding or, you know, adding to it if they just tell all the stuff that we already mentioned. Well, I will tell you this that I found out after the fact, after we did that episode. The hotel that Elisa was staying at. Do you know who Richard Ramirez is? Yeah, the night stalker. He stayed at that hotel in like the seventies or whatever, whatever year he was right in the middle of his killing spree. He stayed at that yeah, hotel, no, I, I and he would consider doing a uh, supernatural episode on the Cecil Hotel as well because there's a lot of crazy shit based around that hotel. Oh yeah, that case, that case, that hotel. Night Stalker and uh, um, Elisa Lamb. Yeah, so definitely let us know. Like I said, join the Facebook group. Let us know what you guys want us to cover or you could message either Steven or I on any of the socials that we gave you. Um, Thank you so much for listening, guys. And if you're ready to sign off, Steven. Right. Um, Shit. That got dark. (laughs) have a great night guys thanks for listening bye bye Hey, this is Stefan from Unsolved Comedies. So if you have any theories on the case that we just discussed, please mention it in the comment section. And also like and subscribe my page, Dragon Blazer Productions. Right there, right there. Just, you know, click on that. Subscribe, you know, there's a little thumbs up. Like it. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, I'm Steven from many different podcasts like Drunk Like Me, Pro Wrestling Apologist, The Rage and Blaze Show, and of course, That Got Dark. So, please like and subscribe.